Good afternoon. Welcome to the November 7th meeting of the Communications Equity and Diversity Council of the Federal Communications Commission. At today's meeting, we will hear a presentation of the CEDC's Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group on its findings and recommendations for states and localities to prevent digital discrimination by internet service providers. Today's featured report represents more than 10 months of research, interviews, and deliberations by a group of very dedicated professionals and experts. The members of this working group, along with representatives from the CEDC's other two working groups, met several times each week to hear from experts, including state and local government officials, housing experts, community advocates, economists, and internet service providers. These meetings provided invaluable insights Jim on how to create equal access to digital services and products. Now all. joining. On behalf of Chairwoman Rosenworcel, we want to thank each of the members of the CEDC for your tireless work on this report. I know it wasn't easy, but I and the Chairwoman appreciate all of your efforts. We especially want to thank Chair Heather Gate, Vice Chairs Dr. Nicole Turner Lee, and Sue Allen. DEI Working Group Chair, Dr. Dominique Harrison, Workstream Leads, Joy Chaney, and Dr. John Gant. We want to thank all of the members of the DEI Working Group for their commitment to this effort and for the collaboration to produce today's report. I look forward to your presentation. Now we will hear from our designated federal officer, Jamila Best Johnson. Jamila, take it away. Good afternoon. Thank you, Holly. I want to say thank you to all of the CEDC members, working group members, and subject matter experts for joining today's meeting. We have a short but highly anticipated agenda today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the DEI working group for all of its diligent work for almost a full year in developing its report and recommendations on model policies and best practices to prevent digital discrimination by ISPs. We're really, really looking forward to hearing your report today. Next, we will have welcome remarks from the CEDC's co-deputy designated officer, Rashawn Duval. Rashawn. Good afternoon, and thank you, Jamila Bass. It is such an honor to be present at this meeting concerning the CEDC Digital Equity and Inclusion Working Group's report on recommendations and best practices to prevent digital discrimination by internet service providers. I would like to extend a tremendous, with a capital T, thank you to the working group members and other members of the CEDC for their extensive work on this important task. In particular, I would like to acknowledge and express gratitude to CEDC Chair Heather Gates and her vice chairs, Susan L. Allen and Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee, working group chair, Dr. Dominique Harrison, and the work stream leads, Dr. John Gant and Joy Cheney, for their tremendous guidance and leadership and just extensive effort on this report. I'm looking forward to today's presentation. Thank you, Rashawn. And now we will hear from our co-deputy designated federal officer, Kayla hernandez Uloa. Kayla? Good afternoon, everyone. I too echo the, everything that has been said before. This has been a tremendous effort and this I congratulate my... everyone oh, okay. on All right. their I'll efforts to okay. achieve this report. Um, I'd like to thank Chair Heather Gate, Vice Chair Nicole Turner-Lee mm -hmm. and Susan All Allen. Um, I'd like to thank also of course, everyone that's worked on from the DFO's part, Jamila Best Johnson, Rashawn Duvall, and Aureli Matthew, for all their works and efforts. I'm looking forward to learning more about this report, and I'm turning it back to you, Jamila. Thank you so much, Kayla. And now we will hear from our newest colleague, who's been so instrumental uh, to the administrative and support tasks that we've had to do on this report, Aureli Matthew, who's an attorney advisor in the Wireline Competition Bureau. Aureli? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aureli Matthew, um, and I'd like to echo um, the sentiments of Jamila, Rashawn, and Kayla. 
it's a pleasure to see this report come to fruition. It wouldn't be possible without the leadership of our workstream leads, um, Joy Cheney and Dr. Gant, our working group leader, Do Dr. Dominique Harrison, and our chairs and vice chairs, Heather Gate, Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee, and Suzanne O. Allen. And I look forward to hearing about the recommendations today. Thank you for joining us. I'll pass it back to you, Jamila. Thank you so much, Arely. Really appreciate it. And now we turn the meeting over to our CEDC chair, Heather Gate, for her opening remarks. Good afternoon, Heather. Good afternoon, Jamila. Thank you so much, Holly, for, for welcoming us and opening this meeting. Also, thanks to our distinguished designated federal officers, Jamila, Rashad, Kayla, and Aureli. I welcome CDC members to this important meeting. I welcome FCC staff and members of the public. I'm honored to join you for this important task of deliberating on our report on recommendations and best practices to prevent digital discrimination and promoting digital equity. Thank you to Chairwoman Rosenworcel for trusting us with this important task and giving us more time on July 22 to continue our work. I'm happy to let you know that we took that additional time and we used it wisely. As a truly diverse body of professionals, we understand what's at stake with this task. The bipartisan infrastructure law, which tasks the FCC with making recommendations to states and localities on preventing digital discriminations by ISP, represents a momentous step towards bridging the digital divide and advancing equal access. Congress rightfully <laughs> recognized that. In today's world, access to affordable, reliable, high-speed broadband is essential for any person to fully participate in modern society in the United States. The opportunity for the CEDC to offer recommendations is an important piece of the bigger puzzle that includes public comments and the work of the FCC's Digital Discrimination Task Force. I want to extend a large thank you to the entire Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group. Under the leadership of Dr. Dominique Harrison, they did a tremendous job in researching, interviewing experts, and participating in several meetings a week and writing this exceptional report. Thanks to the Workstream leads, Dr. John Gant and Joy Cheney for their leadership. Special shout out to Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee in helping to write and edit the report. Again, I want to thank each and every one of the member of the D Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group. Lastly, but not least, I want to recognize my other vice chair, Susan O. Allen, for being a steadfast leader for this council and always pushing for with great passion for discussions and work products that will truly make a difference. So I'm gonna keep it short. Our agenda for today consists of one item and one item alone, and that is to deliberate and vote on part one of our report by the Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group. If you remember on July 22, we voted to adopt part two and part three that were presented by the Innovation and Access Working Group and the Diversity and Equity Working Groups led by Robert Brooks and Chris Woods, respectively. I'd like to thank that group, although they're not going to be presenting today, I'd love, I'd like to extend my gratitude for their continued work. And I urge you all to stay tuned as they will be announcing and doing some exciting work over the next few months. Without further ado, I'd like to invite my vice chair, Susan Allen, to offer her opening comments. Thank you, Heather. This is the day I've been looking forward to. And before I say a few words about the hardworking group that brought this report into fruition, I want to thank, of course, the leadership at the FCC first with Chairwoman Jessica Rosenwasso and the entire commission, plus the woman who will never be fatigued, 
Jamila J Beth Johnson and her wonderful team of um, uh, deputy uh, uh, designated officers, Rashan Duvall, Kayla Hernandez, Urula, Aureli Matthews. Thank you so much for being the guiding light for all of us, for all these working groups that bring us to where we are today. Uh, Heather, your patience and your counsel has been so appreciated. I don't want to say thanks to you before Thanksgiving. Without your steady hand, together with the team at the FCC, we would may not be where we are today. But most of all, the credit goes to the working group led by Dr. Dominique Harrison and the, her ABLE team, Dr. Gant and, Dr. and uh, Judge Haney, and the whole group of hardworking professionals and industry experts. You discussed, you fretted over big things, small things, minute details. You actually gave, gave and take. You had your eye on the ball, on the mission. Today, we are here. So without further delay, I want to throw it back to Heather and let's hear from all of you. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you, Susan. I would like to go ahead and offer my apologies for uh, Dr. Turner Lee. She's stuck in another meeting, but she and I will reverse the privilege to offer her the floor as soon as she's able to join us so she can uh, offer her opening comments. And now, uh, Jamila, are we ready to call the meeting to order? And then we will offer Dr. Turner Lee the opportunity to offer her opening comments as soon as she's able to join us. Yes, that would be fine. Would you like for me to conduct the roll now? Yes, okay. without much ado, I would therefore like to call to order the November 7 to 2022 meeting of the Communications Equity and Diversity Council. And uh, Jamila, if you'd like to take the honor of doing our roll call. Okay, so we'll start with CEDC chairs and vice chairs, and then we'll move through each uh, respective working group uh, for members, working group members, and subject matter experts. So when you hear your name call, please feel free to turn on your camera and your mic and acknowledge that you're present for today's meeting. Thank you. Okay. Chair Heather Gate. Present. Susan R. Allen. Present. Vice Chair. Present. Thank you. Nicole Turner Lee, Vice Chair. I'm present by phone. I'm having some technical challenges, but I'm present by phone. Thank you. All right, now we're gonna to turn to the Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group. Dominique Harrison, Chair. Present. Clayton Banks. I'm here. Indeed you are. Brent, <laughs> Robert Branson. Present. Is Robert, is Robert Branson here? Present. Thank you. Thank you. Joy Cheney. Present. Michelle Cover. Present. Sarah Kate Ellis. Present. Rebecca Gibbons. Present. Chris James. Present. Roderick Johnson. Present. Thank you. Nicolaine Lazar. Laura Barakal. Present. Louis Perez. Present. Vicki Robinson indicated that she would be on after 1.30, so we'll acknowledge her for the roll call when she's present. Matthew, Matthew Wood. Here. Anissa Green. I'm here. Thank you. Kuman Hedayate. Here. No. 
Human. Human held the Yati. I'm gonna mark Human is absent. I don't I don't hear Human. Angela Seifer or Sion Tesfaye. Present. Okay, thank you. John C. Yang. Dr. Christopher Ali. Dr. John Gantz. I'm present. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Guyong Kim. All right, that completes the role for the DEI Jamila. working group. Jamila, Nicole is Yes. Who? Nicole, yes. Nicole, Nicole is, is joining. Joining. Yes. Yes, I will give her an opportunity for opening comments in a second. Uh, Jamila, yes. just to confirm, we have a quorum to conduct this meeting. Jamila, this is Rosa Mendoza. I didn't hear my name called, but I'm on the call. Right. I haven't I haven't completed the role yet. No. Oh, okay. okay. Sorry, <laughs> that completed the role for the for the DEI working group, and now for the innovation and access working group, Robert Banks. I mean Brooks. I'm sorry, Robert Brooks. Yes, I'm present. Raul, Ar okay, thank you, Raul Arlacan, Matthew Bauer. Present. Hello, Jamila. Thank you. Hi, Matt. Carolyn Beasley. Here. Edgar Class. Present. Cecilia Gordon. Present. Thank you. David Honick. Present. Sherman Kissart. Present. Thank you. Henry Rivera. Yes, here. Thank you, Henry. Stephen Roberts. Present. Welcome, everybody. Hi, Steve. Jocelyn Tate. Jocelyn Tate. Hello, present. Thank you. Barbara Sierra. Susan Corbett. Monica Desai or Alicia Tambe. Present. Thank you. Charles Harrell. Howie Hodges. Present. Jennifer Jackson. Present. Leticia Latino Van Splutterin. Yes, present. Eve Lewis. Present. Hello. Hi. Dr. Diane Lynch. Present. Thank you. All right, that completes the role for the Innovation and Access Working Group. And now to conclude, we're going to call the role for the Diversity and Equity Working Group. Christopher Wood. Present. Thank you. Melody Span Cooper. Present. Skip Dillard. Present. Jill Houghton. Present. Dr. Ronald Johnson. Rosa Mendoza. Present. Amanahuja. Present. Brian Scarpelli. 
I am uh, present. There we go. Thank oh. you. Charlene Stanberry. Present. Antonio Tijerino. Jim Winston. Okay. Jenny Asamie. Present. June Bang. Faith Bautista. Present. Bridget Daniel Corbin. Lily Gangas. Otto Padron. Brandy Parker. Ellen Schned. Present. Dr. Kathy Schubert. Present. And Mona Thompson. Madam Chair, that concludes the role. You have a quorum for today's meeting. Thank you, Javilla. Thank you so much. And so before we move on to our agenda, I would like to uh, welcome the most hardworking digital inclusion practitioner in the country. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm often talking to uh, Nicole while she's navigating two or three meetings and writing a book and doing everything that she does. Um, so, uh, Nicole, if you'd like to take a second and, and do your opening comments for us, and we'll move on to the agenda. Perfect. Can you hear me? There's a little bit of no one can hear me. Now. Hear me now? No, no. I think do you we can hear you. It's a little bit far. What do you want to use your phone audio? Do you still have your phone audio? No. No. If something is going on my We can hear you well enough for you to do your opening comments. Are you sure I'm not, you sure I'm not an echo? You are echoing. Yeah, Madam Chair, we'll proceed with the meeting. I'll come back in at the end if you don't mind, because I'm having technical issues. Today. No, I think so. I know. It's okay. I had to mute some people. Oh, okay. That's the point. Okay, thank you. All right. So you can hear me clear right now, right? Yes. Yes. Just a little louder. <laughs> Well, thank you, Heather, Jamila, Beth, Rashawn, Kayla, Aureli, um, and all of you that joined this call. Today is a long-awaited day due to the hard work of the CED DEI Working Group under the chairwomanship of Dominique Harrison, Dr. Harrison. And more importantly, for the millions of Americans that have to rely upon an internet connection for their lifeline. So we stand before everybody and I'm excited for this day because obviously this work is very important to myself, Susan, and Heather. As the statute suggests that the FCC has been charged with defining digital discrimination and obviously from the work of the DEI committee, there's still more work that needs to be undertaken. But at least a framework is being introduced in this meeting to allow us for states and localities to have a start and some guidance. Monies have been allocated, so the timing could not be more perfect. And I commend this group for their earnest and hardworking attention to this task and to the FCC for their patience with us as a committee and as for people who care about this issue of discrimination. It is no secret that we are on the eve of another fundamental inalienable right of voting. And when there is discrimination when it comes to voting, it is not much different than restricting, limiting, or foreclosing on opportunities for people 
to exercise a say in our democracy. And the same is true for digital access, Madam Chairwoman and Vice Chairwoman and all of you on this call. Without universal access to broadband, we essentially encroach upon the civil rights of people whether and businesses and people's ability to access fundamental services like educational, employment, healthcare, entrepreneurship. And so that is why I actually just leave these remarks both on the timeliness of this meeting, but more importantly, the diligence of this committee that we've started important work and what this looks like in the future will only change. But one thing is clear that the leaders that are represented on this group represent the constituents that are going to be impacted. And so I just say to all of you, again, I commend you for your hard work. I commend you for your service. And I look forward to presenting this report from the DEI working group. And I look forward to all of us getting to work because again, our job with discrimination is never done. Our inalienable rights to participate in democracy are never done. But somebody's got to do the hard work, and that was all of us. So thank you again, Madam Chairman, for allowing me this opportunity in spite of my technical challenges. Uh, it's like having holes in your shoes when you're trying to walk to the pole. But guess what? I'm going to try and figure this out before the end of the meeting. So I appreciate the opportunity to work with you. And Susan. Thank you so much, Nicole. Uh, your technical difficulties really helped to highlight the importance of of technology in, in just being able to communicate and drive the work that we're doing along. Um, and so thank you again for your impassioned uh, call to action. We always welcome your voice in these uh, and your expertise in these discussions. And now I would like to go ahead and um, put hand over the floor to the Digital Empowered Inclusion Working Group led by Dr. Harrison. Dr. Harrison, thank you. If you can feel free to take the floor and present uh, part one of the report for us. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. I wanna first thank to thanks and a thank you to Chairwoman Rosenworcel for her commitment to tackling the issue of digital discrimination. Digital discrimination is an important topic to cover given the material consequences that communities face in their adoption of broadband, the affordability of broadband services, and the actual use of the technology. One of the objectives of the Digital Empowerment Inclusion Working Group is to provide recommendations for reducing and removing regulatory barriers to the equitable deployment of and investment in broadband access and adoption in all communities, including tribal, rural, and historically marginalized communities. Given this goal and the role that many of us play in this space, developing solutions that lead to more equitable outcomes for communities of color should be a priority for all leaders as we work together towards closing the digital divide. I wanna thank our CEDC chair and vice chairs for their leadership and support. I also wanna thank the FCC designated federal office for their encouragement and stewardship along the way in the development of this report. Today, I am pleased to share the final report of the DEI Working Group. I am so appreciative, thankful, and proud of all the work our group undertook to complete this task. And I wanna thank each member for their participation, guidance, and support. Next slide. Thank you to Dr. Christopher Ali, representing Penn State University, Clayton Banks from Silicon Harlem, Robert Branson from the Multicultural Media Telecom and Internet Council, Joy Cheney from National Urban League, Michelle Kober from Verizon, Sarah Kate Ellis from GLAAD, Matt Wood from Free Press, formerly Leo Fitzpatrick, Dr. Jan Gent, representing North Carolina Central University, Anissa Green, AT&T, Chris James from the National Center for American Indian Enterprise Development, Dr. Gu Yong Kim, Chain University of Pennsylvania, Nicole J Lazar from Charter Communication, and Lo Laura Baracall, who has served as alternate, Louis Peretz, Wireless Internet Service Providers Association, Vicki Robinson from Microsoft, Angela Seifer for the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, including Sasan Tisafe, who is an alternative. Human Hidachi, 
Communications Workers of America, formerly Brian Thorne, John C. John C. Yang from the Asian Americans Advancing Justice, and lastly, Roderick Johnson from Comcast Corporation, where Antonio Williams served as an alternate. Next slide. The passage of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act made the largest federal investment into universal broadband access in our history by providing critical resources to increase access to the technology. The IIJA also presents an unprecedented opportunity to address the issue of digital discrimination, an issue that many communities have long spoken about. With our working group's objectives in mind and the directives set within the Infrastructure Act, our group was given the immediate task to address these issues. The IIJA section 60506 of the act states that, subscribers should benefit from equal access to broadband internet access service within the service area of a provider of such service. The term equal access for purposes of this section means the equal opportunity to subscribe to an offered service that provides comparable speeds, capacities, latency, and other quality of service metrics in a given area for comparable terms and conditions. Next slide. The act also go out, goes on to say that no later than two years after the date of enactment of this act, the commission shall adopt final rules to facilitate equal access to broadband internet access service, taking into account the issue of technical and economic feasibility presented by that objective, including preventing digital discrimination of access based on income level, race, ethnicity, ethnicity color, religion, or national origin, and identifying necessary steps for the commission to take to eliminate discrimination described in paragraph one. The commission and the attorney general shall ensure that federal policies promote equal access to robust broadband internet access service by prohibiting deployment discrimination based on the income level of an area, the predominant race or ethnicity composition of an area, or other factors the commission determines to be relevant based on the finding of the record developed from the rulemaking under subsection B. Next slide. The legislation then states that the FCC shall develop model policies and best practices that can be adopted by states and localities to ensure that broadband internet access service providers do not engage in digital discrimination. This leads us to the bulk of the work that the DEI working group undertook over the course of 10 months. Next slide. One of the inaugural urgent tasks of the CDC, CEDC was to present recommendations to the commission on the public policies, programs, and other strategic initiatives to advance equity in the provision of and access to digital communication services and products for all people of the United States without discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, or disability. The particular request of the commission in December 2021 was to examine issues around lack of access to broadband services and providers. Two, help better understand the reasons and causes for such lack of access. And three, offer recommendations for addressing digital discrimination and other barriers that impact equitable access to the emerging technology in the US, including its territories, particularly in communities that remain unserved, underserved, or underconnected. Next slide. While many members of the DEI working group played an essential part in getting us to the finish line on this report, there were a specific group of members in our working group that provided their time, effort, and expertise to complete the report. And I wanna say thank you to each one of them for their commitment to this important work. As we know, it was no easy feat. Thank you to our co-leads who led the group, Dr. John Gant and Joy Cheney. Today, we will hear from the co-leads of Workstream One of the DEI Working Group on an in-depth overview of our report entitled, Recommendations and Best Practices to Prevent Digital Discrimination and Promote Digital Equity. And with that said, I will turn it over to Joy Taney to come on camera. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Harrison. You have been a fantastic leader. And Dr. Harrison did a lot of the writing on this project, which we will talk about in a few minutes. Can you go back to the previous slide? Before we go on, uh, one of the things that Dr. Gant, who will be on in a moment, 
uh, as well as Dr. Harrison and I and all of the CEDC leadership wanted to do was to begin by talking about our process and how we did this work. Again, my name is Joy Cheney, and I am a representative of the National Urban League. And we are so proud of not only the IIJA, which we helped to make sure was passed, but also the work of this group and the FCC. And we want to thank the chairwoman. When we began this model policies and best practices to prevent digital discrimination work stream work, we had a core group of folks. So we have an include a complete digital empowerment and inclusion working group, but a small group of us began on the work stream one. And I want to identify those folks right now because we began our work almost not quite a year or so ago, but many, many months and uh, they deserve that recognition. So Robert, we already did their affiliation, so let me just list their names. Robert Branson, Michelle <coughs> Culver. Jim Lily Winston. Gates. All right, if everyone can mute. Is, is now joined. exiting. Great. Robert Branson, Michelle Culver, Lily Genghis, who is an ad hoc member from the Diversity and Equity Working Group, Anna Gomez an ad hoc member as well from the Innovation and Access Working Group, Anissa Green, Nicole Lazar, Louise Perez, Perez, and I apologize if I mispronounced anyone's name, Angela Seifer, who was represented by Scion, which we had just ad identified before, Brian Thorne, who was replaced ultimately by Fuman, um, who, when Brian left the organization, Brian Johnson, who was represented ably by Tony Williams, and Dr. Fallon Wilson, uh, who was formerly an ad hoc member of the Diversity and Equity Working Group. And when you hear us say an ad hoc member, that means that they were joining from another work stream within the CEDC. We thought it was very important to make sure that this particular group, we understood that not all of the expertise that we wanted um, had to be on this group all the time, and that we had to borrow from other parts of the CEDC and, of course, of the Digital Empowerment Inclusion Working Group. And to that end, I would be remiss without echoing that ultimately this became a group effort of the entire DEI Working Group, not just this small group. But we did begin several months ago with meeting a couple of times a week. And if we do next slide, I think we can go into more detail. Next slide. Wonderful. So we met a couple of times a week, uh, Mondays and sometimes Tuesdays, uh, a few times on Thursdays, and ultimately always on Fridays. So anywhere from two to four times a week, we would get together to begin this work. We started as we identified in the first meeting when we first outlined how we were going to do this work. We said we wanted to do research and information gathering. So much has been said out there about digital discrimination from many different sources and, and from other perspectives that we knew would be critical to our work. We did a lot of re research and information gathering, a lot of background re research from published materials, a lot of documented history of digital discrimination and the digital divide. We gathered success stories from states and localities um, and stories that were not a success, places where we knew that we wanted to do better. We inquired about business models of internet networks and infrastructure because we know that plays a role. And we examined other discrimination challenges and discrimination from other parts of our um, American experience. In total, we conducted, um, in addition to our research review, over 30 interviews. And sometimes those interviews would range between 45 minutes to almost an hour. So it's a considerable investment of time of not just uh, the work stream, but all of the DEI working group or committee members. Uh, after that, we engaged in significant deliberation, reflection, and synthesis, just what it, it says here. Um, we wanted, um, you know, in those interviews to make sure that we were hearing from a range of voices. So while we are not listing all, of, you know, the folks that we interviewed by name, I mean, it could be the categories. We wanted to hear from digital inclusion and public interest technology advocates, 
civil rights organizations like the National Urban League and so many others um, who come from a range of perspectives, racial and ethnic, gender, disability, age, um, among others. Community-based advocates, community anchor institutions, right? Um, internet service providers, of course, we have internet service providers on, on, the, um, on the committee itself minority internet service providers, right? So not not just uh, large ISPs, we wanted some smaller ones as well, state and locality officials, housing advocates, health equity advocates, educators and academics, uh, faith-based institutions, economists, policy analysts, housing and civil rights bar, uh, representatives and social service providers. Now look, if we didn't interview, right, the person in the live interview, we made sure we were hearing from perspectives through some of the research that we read. And we had a dynamic process. Next slide. Next slide. Great. We had a dynamic process. We reviewed research, we conducted interviews, we synthesized information, and we spent a lot of time on deliberation. Um, so our process when we were doing our research reviews or our conducting our interviews, if we found one of the things we would always ask, and I know in a second, I believe the next slide lists our questions that we asked, our interview questions. Let's try that. Next slide. One of the things we always wanted to know is what else we should be doing. So one of the things that we do and I did when I say it was dynamic, if we found that we were lacking um, in a perspective, we were not afraid to extend the time and make sure we added that person, added that voice, added that perspective. And I think it really made for a, a thorough process and a rich experience. And I know Dr. Kent will go into more details about the, the results, but it, it led, it came from the, the foundation of it uh, were these, these interviews, the interview questions, and all of the people who contributed to the process. So the questions that we started off with um, and almost every interviewee um, got this question was how to define digital discrimination, how to define digital redlining, if that were was not a term that they used already. We wanted to know, did they use that term or not? How are their constituents experiencing um, and how are they impacted by digital discrimination? We wanted to make sure we had not lost the human touch, how it impacts people on the ground. What efforts have they or their employees or organizations undertaken to address digital discrimination? We wanted to know what the community was doing to combat perceived discrimination or in fact, real discrimination. What does digital equal access look like? Because it's not so much just about combating discrimination. We wanted to affirmatively say, what's the world that we want to see? What would be make the biggest difference in advancing digital equal access? So if you had a magic wand, what would you do in order to ensure digital equal access? What are the economic and regulatory considerations that incentivize private investment? We know that that is a question that, of course, has to be answered. And we exist in the real world, not a fantasy one. So we understand that though the answers to those questions were important. And we wanted to ask, to ask those in industry and those outside of industry, what considerations uh, incentivize private investment? And then finally, like I said, we always wanted to know what else should we be looking at? Who else should we be talking to? Next slide. So the result, I think, was a solid one. Now, let me go on and say this. We spent a lot of time on deliberation. I think you all know that. We got the extended time, and we want to thank the FCC and our chairs for allowing us to do that. We had a very big committee, a very robust committee. We engaged in a lot of conversation back and forth. Agreement and disagreement alike took place. Please mute. Thank you. Agreement and disagreement took place, but ultimately we were able to come to a great deal of consensus and not just consensus, real solution, real best practices, real advice for those who are doing this work on the ground. Our report is outlined as follows. We have a background on narrative on digital discrimination that you know echoes what we've been hearing in our interviews. 
We have recommendations also that echoes what we were hearing in our interviews and our research for model policies. Uh, for best practices for states and localities to prevent discrimination by ISPs. And then finally, um, our recommendations for next steps, that's what people should be doing in order to address these issues. And so with that, um, Dr. Gant, who I want to take a personal privilege to say thank you for the work he did. I led a lot of the interviews. Dr. Gant and Dr. Harrison uh, led almost exclusively the writing part, along with the broader working group, weighing in every day, always editing with so almost every single person here uh, wrote, almost every single person here on our working group edited. Um, and so I want to thank uh, them for their leadership and everyone for their input. With that, Dr. Gant. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Joy, and it was a pleasure uh, working uh, with you as co-leads on this very important task. And I certainly want to thank uh, the chairwoman for her trusting us for this work, our our our, um, our leads as well, and uh, in particular, uh, Dr. Dominique Harrison, and of course, everyone that uh, you all that were um, intricately uh, involved with um, all aspects of this report uh, and so forth. And I also want to take a point of personal privilege here that it is just awesome that we have reached this very particular um, point here. The extra time has been extremely helpful to go deeper into the deliberations uh, and so forth. And I'm also excited because I, I serve as an independent subject matter expert. And as many of you know, I'm a professor at and dean at North Carolina Central University. And it's been an awesome weekend here for us as we've enjoyed our homecoming and we had the great opportunity of seeing barbecue all across our campus and the smell of Howard Bison coming from the football field, which is meant to be a very friendly joke to all of my Ooh. colleagues that are from Howard University as well too and, and play and uh, we enjoyed having you here for uh, the homecoming uh, game. So thank you. <laughs> and we won. <laughs> All right, I just had to throw that in there because a part of what's happened through all this process is that we have really, um, while we have different perspectives, we've really come together in a very respectful way, working together with colleagues and and, and so forth, and, and, and a friendship is, has evolved from there. But I do want to really share some very important information and insight that we've gained from these important interviews. Um, and I'll, and I'll, I'll share uh, some findings from the interviews. I'll walk through some of the model policies and best practices uh, and recommendations around digital discrimination and similar ones on digital equity. And looking at our time, I'll try and keep it about roughly seven to 10 minutes on each. I'm not gonna be able to go into a lot of detail in, in, in for all of them as well too, which will give us plenty of time for discussion uh, at the end. So there are, some, there are a number of very important findings from these interviews, as I said, as Joy explained, the interviews gave us a lot of insight from multiple perspectives. And I just want to walk through some of these to really show how these interviews have helped inform the recommendations that we uh, are making today as well in this report. Uh, the first is that tackling the digital divide is both urgent and imperative. And certainly, and even in our opening comments today, uh, as Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee so eloquently brought up and others have brought up how there, there's this fierce urgency of now in trying to deal with this uh, particular issue. And so we've heard that as a common theme through many of our interviews as well too. Um, the other thing that we've learned and really have considered greatly is the extent to which digital discrimination can appear in multiple contexts. Uh, this is very important for us to understand because it's not a cut and dry type of issue. Uh, in fact, um, it continues to be defined in different experiences in different contexts. Uh, we know that uh, we looked at you know, the understanding from the American Disabilities Act and how it was defined, financial services, uh, you know, some important studies around financial services have really helped inform our, our understanding. Uh, when we look at the extent of algorithms uh, you know, which are under scrutiny, and really driving and contributing to uh, what looked like discriminatory outcomes as well. And then uh, the meaning and the impact of, of the digital context itself is very, context, is very complex as our society evolves and how we are using 
uh, computers uh, and so forth. And I hear an open mic, so if, if all of us could please mute, that'd be really great as well. Uh, just a second. I got the power to mute here. Let's see. Just a second. If we can get some help on who's ever driving. All right, thank you. Uh, thirdly, uh, the commission has some working definitions of discrimination on the record, and we've also contributed some additional uh, definitions that have been available through our interviews to help understand digital discrimination and digital uh, redlining. Uh, we considered published definitions of digital redlining. Um, we've looked at uh, even former uh, FCC chairman uh, Pai, you know, de defined uh, digital redlining as the underinvestment in broadband networks uh, and so forth. And these responses have been really helpful for us to uh, really contribute to um, the broader task of defining uh, digital redlining and digital uh, discrimination. And we've included those contributions in this report uh, as well. Um, fourth, uh, we also wrestled with the, the very uh, difficult issue of trying to understand the intent for digital discrimination and really concluded that it certainly needs to be further examined. In our report itself, our interviewees and DEI working group members offered diverging perspectives on the foundational matter whether digital uh, discriminatory impact as opposed to discriminatory, discriminatory intent should be an evaluation by which uh, dis digital discrimination can be ascertained. And in our report, we did not adopt either framework. We, under, we did a lot to understand both perspectives uh, and we presented both perspectives, but we did not adopt either um, framework. And so that was, uh, that's a very important uh, point uh, that we've gained through these interviews. Uh, fifth point is that uh, broadband adoption may drive outcome differences for vulnerable populations. When we look at this, especially when we get down to the details of looking how uh, what drives discrimination, uh, you know, especially if you're looking at outcomes and so forth, it's often hard to really try and ascertain and untangle this very complex process. And so um, we want to be clear that um, some of our interviewers shared information that digital discrimination may contribute to disparities in broadband adoption and the use of technologies, digital technologies, which may you know, drive the digital divide. However, we also have other interviews that uh, interviewers that conveyed uh, important observations that it may not be accurate to simply look at the differences in adoption data and assume that disparities based on race, gender, income, and others are are digital discrimination as well. And so, this is the uh, very important part of a contribution that we've made here in trying to help sort that out uh, as well. Uh, sixthly. Uh, broadband deployment decisions may have unintended negative consequences. As expressed in the legislation, uh, it was very important to really for us to dig in and try and understand those economic and technical feasible feasibility issues about connecting everybody to broadband. You know, we have to consider the extent to which uh, we, we consider location, topology, um, the cost of trying to reach and, and so forth. In, in driving uh, broadband adoption decisions. And so uh, we uh, considered a lot of great information from uh, various interviews to really give us a greater understanding about those decisions so we could really um, be able to uh, provide additional information about the economic and feasibility side of this issue as well. And, and there are times where there are very legitimate situations where that feasibility is hard to reach everybody, uh, and so forth. And so it's a very important consideration uh, uh, in, in our work uh, as well. Um, then uh, seventh, uh, the consideration around uh, franchise agreements. Uh, there's well-established uh, law and practice of local governments and state governments using franchise agreements uh, as a way of governing the deployment of 
our communication network infrastructure in the United States, uh, particularly and locally, and also governed through the Federal Cable Act. Um, and in our interviews, uh, we uh, really came to the point from hearing from uh, our experts that franchise agreements were seen as a way of holding cable companies accountable for service quality, tracking customer complaints, build out requirements, uh, and so forth. And there was a question that we continue to ask is, uh, how, to what extent are these franchise agreements are an effective mechanism for ensuring that uh, deployment's happening in an equitable um, fashion uh, as well? It also raises um, the important understanding about the construction process, access to right-of-ways, uh, access to um, facilities, uh, and, and that kind of thing, uh, too. So, um, so those were uh, some of the areas that we uh, covered here in terms of what we found in uh, some of the, uh, from the interviews uh, themselves. Now we'll transition here to the next slide. And we'll look at model policies and best practices. And these are informed through these interviews. And we'll walk through each of these. Uh, the first one uh, recommendation is that uh, the working group uh, recommends that uh, through assessment processes, state and local leaders should seek to identify the current broadband needs of their community. So in doing so, state and local leaders should be part of a process to help develop, implement, and make publicly available uh, periodic broadband equity assessments in partnership with ISPs, community, and local um, stakeholders. Uh, we feel that these assessments are a way of really trying to understand what broadband service is currently available, who has reliable and consistent uh, high-speed broadband service at home, um, and other issues around the cost of broadband services and the quality of broadband services in communities as well. I think it's important that broadband equity assessment data help identify those unserved and underserved areas and also be used as a means to help direct funds and infrastructure towards those areas to meet and, uh, and support deployment uh, as well. Uh, secondly, uh, we recommend that there should be effort to facilitate greater awareness and information sharing among multiple dwelling unit owners. Uh, Multiple dwelling units are a special case where uh, ISPs and other you know, broadband providers work closely with those multiple dwelling unit owners to make sure that everybody in those units have access to uh, broadband uh, and so forth. And so uh, our committee learned from the interviews and recommend that we should, uh, state and localities should raise awareness of the FCC rules regarding multiple tenant environments or multiple dwelling units and consider ways to facilitate information sharing uh, in this domain uh, to the owners to really help inform decision-making process when considering as uh, con the conditions to reach everybody as they enter in agreements with the internet service providers. Uh, there's a spirit here of trying to help promote greater competition and choice uh, even in multiple dwelling units uh, as well. And, uh, and so we offer recommendation to address that particular issue. Uh, thirdly, uh, we recommend identifying local opportunities that could be used to incentivize equitable uh, deployment. Uh, state and localities should, in collaboration with ISPs, community organizations, consumer advocates, and others, uh, to identify and pursue opportunities to incentivize these collaborative approaches. Um, we should look at rules uh, to help state and localities look at rules around dig once, permitting requirements and other activities to really facilitate equitable uh, broadband deployment. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. Uh, fourth, uh, we offer recommendation to engage where permissible under state and federal law uh, in the manage of, of public rights of ways uh, to avert discriminatory behavior that may result or sustain digital discrimination or redlining. Um, when we think about the build-out um, process, uh, there are many agreements around the use of right-of-ways, and these right-of-ways, um, these agreements should reflect that working in those right-of-ways is a privilege of using public assets, and it also comes with an obligation uh, to provide benefits to the public. 
especially to ensure that everybody in the community has equal access to broadband, subject to the limitations around the economic and techn technological feasibility of making this type of deployment. Uh, we recommend that states should examine their statutes and policies to ensure broadband providers benefiting from public access provide appropriate public benefits, uh, especially to address potential uh, digital discrimination. Fifth, uh, convene regular meetings of broadband providers and stakeholders, including community acres, uh, public interest groups, community advocates, faith-based uh, institutions, and others um, to really evaluate the extent to which areas and households are unserved or underserved with competitive and quality uh, broadband options. You do see a theme here where many of our recommendations are very much about bringing uh, multiple stakeholders together uh, to really work in a communal way, uh, in, a, in a common way, so it's a better way of saying it, uh, to provide equitable deployment and adoption as well. And as well. Um, sixthly, encourage um, fair competition and choice. Uh, we recommend state and localities should continue to explore the role of competition and choice, not only in accelerating consumer options, but also thinking about what it means on the other end in terms of seamless engagement with online resources that really can help with, with quality of life as well. And certainly this competition among ISPs may help to lower costs for consumers and improve quality of service uh, for as well. So I think that's also very important. Uh, next slide, please. So the interviews in our task primarily focused around making these recommendations for digital discrimination. But in this process, we learned a great deal about other factors that may also help to support digital equity as well. And this goes above and beyond what we were asked to do. But given, as we talked earlier about the urgency of now and this imperative and also the complexity of this issue, our committee also decided to provide additional recommendations to support digital equity. We do this uh, to help move the needle to make sure that everybody gets connected. But we also do it with being very aware that we do not want to minimize or overshadow the great importance of dealing with digital discrimination. So we really want to make that point very clearly. So uh, first, and we'll go through this a little bit more rapidly, but the first uh, recommendation is, was to make uh, uh, low-cost broadband available to low-income households through government benefit programs uh, as well, in combination with internet service providers, low-income programs. We're learning a lot from uh, the uh, emergency broadband program and the ACP program as well. And through, through the lessons learned here, we think it is essential for the FCC to improve all of its programs to really make, uh, to help make uh, broadband access affordable um, for everyone. There's a lot of lessons learned uh, from this process where we can do better uh, in doing so. And, uh, and so we think this is certainly a very uh, important um, priority and recommendation for us to make. Secondly, building on the success of these programs, um, we really want to make sure that uh, it is remains feasible and easy for low-income households to be able to apply some type of credit um, to an internet service of their choice. And so we recommend that state and localities should use available funds to supplement the federal broadband benefits for low-income households. We've seen examples of this that we share uh, in the report as well. Thirdly, also in the, in the band of trying to help supplement access to broadband, it's important to raise awareness about the connectivity programs uh, for programs among el eligible households. There's been a number of research studies that really come out to show how important this is, and we recommend that state and local governments administer uh, these programs uh, that administer low benefit programs also share information widely about uh, access to uh, affordable uh, broadband uh, as well. Now let's move on to the fourth, uh, to the next slide. Uh, fourth, uh, we recommend that we strengthen uh, the FCC and others uh, should, uh, the FCC should work with state and localities to strengthen marketing communications about these programs um, and, uh, and really do what we can 
to uh, make sure that uh, there's great awareness about this, um, particularly during COVID and so forth. Uh, there was great help from groups like the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, as an example, partnered with the FCC to help increase awareness about uh, these programs as well. And we certainly uh, uh, believe that there more work uh, can be done. And then also, um, there's great opportunity for ISPs uh, to uh, put together more materials to help explain offerings in a clear, non-technical language, uh, in multiple language. Uh, we should explore, state and local leaders should also explore supplementing uh, translation services for consumers that need to sign up. Uh, we think about the quality of service, like minimal hold times when you're on the phone trying to get service. Uh, those technical support things, like having somebody to walk the um, family through the process um, step uh, to be able to get through uh, successfully in signing up and using this. Uh, really uh, do things to help make installation instructions clear and easy for folks uh, to follow and to do uh, as well. Fifth, um, streamline the application process. Um, referred, you know, as referred to uh, uh, what we just talked about uh, above. Uh, we know that there is a lot of complexity in these particular programs, especially for ISPs uh, as well, and it does take a lot of time to complete them, uh, and uh, this often gets passed on to complexity for the applicants themselves, and so we really want uh, to do that, and we also make recommendations to improve that, and also try and find other ways to confirm their identity uh, rather than using a social security number. Uh, oftentimes, there's a hesitancy in these programs to give up personal information, and so we want to see if there's some uh, rec some recommendations to try and explore other options, uh, but still keep a high level of, account of accountability and integrity within these programs as well. Um, sixthly, uh, increase support and funding for organizations, uh, including schools, nonprofit, faith-based organizations, to provide digital navigation assistance uh, within the communities uh, that they serve. It's not enough, as we know, to be able to establish broadband programs, but there's a great need, as we say in the report, to have boots on the ground to help drive awareness about these programs, to help uh, participants navigate the application enrollment process, and to work with participants to, to build the digital skills necessary to get the most out of the broadband service. And so we offer recommendations to try and help and address those things. Um, seventh. Uh, we make recommendations to fund, promote, and leverage the use of digital navigators. Uh, digital navigators are typically hired volunteers from libraries, social service organizations, community-based organizations, and philanthropies that really have uh, the experience of working face-to-face -face with individuals throughout our communities. Uh, they are a trusted voice in sharing information about how to use computers and so forth. And, we, and these programs can really help to encourage digital empowerment, uh, help to uh, help raise awareness about affordability options, especially for getting devices and, and programming and so forth, help with the application and the installation process that, that we all go through, and help with um, skills. But do it in a way that's very relatable, uh, meets folks right where they are, high level of empathy, and a high level of support to um, to do all of what we can to help bridge the digital divide. Eighth, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we recommend that stakeholders should encourage Congress to create digital public service and engagement programs like the Digital Navigators um, to help with to conduct trainings and outreach, uh, especially in uh, communities that are non-adopting or, or slow uh, to adopt. Um, and, uh, you know, the funding is obvious of how it can really help promote that high touch work of onboarding communities in where there's greatest need. Uh, ninth, related to the skills are increasing device access and participation. Uh, there, you know, in our recommendations, we note there are concerns about the adoption of broadband service, uh, especially when we want to account for the, the access to uh, devices like computers and tablets and so forth. And we know there remain many consumers that do not have regular access um, to the devices and may be using a smartphone, but may need more appropriate devices like a laptop or tablet for those um, 
uh, other needs that you have um, in your everyday life uh, as well. You can't write a report on a smartphone. You can't do homework on a smartphone, uh, for example. And so we really want to improve and increase uh, access to devices and that's in our recommendations. Uh, tenth, uh, the use of public-private partnerships uh, to facilitate remote learning and help close that homework gap. It takes multiple stakeholders, um, frontline uh, nonprofit organizations, the school districts, the libraries, all to be working together to help close this homework gap. Uh, and we've learned a lot from the pandemic, which has really given us a platform to continue further and deepen the extent to which we can close the gap in our communities as well. Uh, and we think public-private partnerships are an important model for making that happen, uh, especially uh, having the FCC to help drive and building those types of, of public-private partnerships. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we should, uh, another recommendation is to ensure that members of the community have safe spaces to access the internet. I think we've heard many stories through our interviews where having that safe space is, safe space is very important. Uh, there are times where we've got to really zero and focus and for doing very important things like applying for jobs, working on resumes, reg registering for government service, doing banking, uh, and so forth. Our libraries and other community anchor institutions uh, really provide a place for giving good access to uh, connectivity that's safe and reliable, but a space it may offer training and so forth, but also a space where you may feel free and comfortable to uh, doing uh, these types of uh, sensitive uh, and, and focused types of activities as well. Uh, next, another, uh, our 12th recommendation is to strengthen digital skilling efforts in underserved uh, communities. While cost can be a factor in broadband adoption, affordability is only one part of the, of the process. Uh, we recommend that state and localities uh, work with nonprofits, community organizations, and the private sector to promote digital skilling. Because uh, we know that digital literacy is one of the greatest barriers to adoption as well. And our 13th recommendation is to encourage the creation of workforce development and training opportunities focused on historically underrepresented uh, communities. Uh, we know that there's great need to really bridge gaining these digital skills, access to devices, getting connected to the internet and so forth, and translating those into workforce ready skills uh, as well. And so it, uh, we certainly heard from our interviewers uh, uh, great examples of models where uh, organizations are on the front line to really bridge and make that happen. Uh, we heard from uh, a number of them and give some examples here in the report that really help to focus on, on doing that uh, as well. Uh, so with that, we can move to the next slide. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you all for giving me this opportunity to run through um, what we learned from the interviews, our recommendations for addressing the digital discrimination, uh, uh, our charge to address digital discrimination, and then also um, our stewardship and think about digital equity where we provide some additional uh, recommendations, uh, 13 of those around digital equity as well. So I'd like to uh, open it up and, and turn the microphone back to Dr. Uh, Dominique Harrison uh, to uh, move us forward where we can uh, open it up for questions and further discussion and so forth. Thank you. Thank you so much to Dr. John Gann and Joy Cheney for going over the report with us. Again, I'm really excited about the work that we were able to accomplish together as a team. And at this moment, I'd like to open it up for any questions regarding our report. I'll also ask Jamila or our chairwoman uh, if there are anything else that I missed, uh, please let me know as we facilitate this portion of the meeting. Thank you so much, um, doc, Dr. Harrison. I would, before the questions, can we open it up to the DEI working group as a whole for any comments or any um, at this point? Well, I, 
I do want to offer one. I, I started to ad lib it with during during the the presentation, but when we got to this last point uh, about the workforce development and working in the underrepresented communities. We did hear a lot about a lot of good models for doing that, and I just want to um, just share with with everybody to hear one example um, that you all may be aware of. You know, the NTIA um, in its work around the Internet for All initiative has just launched the Connecting Minority Communities. Uh, pilot program. And I just want to say here, and I want to brag a bit, but um, and I'm leading the effort here at North Carolina Central where we're the first HBCU to actually receive one of those grants to be able to do that. And it's very instrumental because we'll be able to work as a university and go in the surrounding community next to us um, and provide the devices, provide access to the internet, provide the digital navigator training, and, you know, with folks that are here and then also working with employers so that, um, you know, that as people are gaining these skills, they're going to be, you know, job ready and making that happen uh, too. And so I know the dis digital discrimination is a very tough issue to tackle, but these kinds of efforts really do open up those opportunities. And it's a great privilege to be leading a, a university and the first HBCU uh, to be able to, uh, you know, uh, continue this work as we go forward as well too. And we'll take a lot of lessons learned from these interviews that really shape and to really make sure that we do it with an all of community approach that involves stakeholders uh, from you know all community anchors and so forth. And I just wanted to share that and how that's really helped us with the work that we're doing here as well too. Can I also add that one of the things that we, we share in the report is that the work that we undertook is just the tip of the iceberg, right? Um, as you mentioned, again, these issues are very complex and we're at the beginning of really exploring this topic and understanding the different dynamics that occur uh, as it relates to digital discrimination. So, you know, uh, we're excited to get this work started, but it's not done yet, right? Um, there is work that our group is, you know, undertaking to think more about the different kind of aspects of this issue. But I also know that there are other organizations and companies and individuals who are thinking deeply about this topic. So again, I just want to emphasize that we're just at the beginning of this, but I think we did um, and uncovered a lot of great information that will be helpful to people and organizations going forward. Dr. Harrison, National Urban League is doing that work, but I also want to acknowledge, because I know you can't see the chat, that we have some commentary there. Let's start with Lily Gingas. Lily, would you like to, would you like me to read it or would you like to say it? Lily? Lily, okay, go ahead. Sorry, I was muted. Yeah, I think, thank you so much for sharing all these recommendations. I think there's one point to add is also the need for um, multiple languages, right? As uh, somebody, as an example, where I reside, we have some of the areas with the most number of languages and the local city government has to do multiple translations and that tends to be expensive. And so wondering, um, you know, thought as we look at digital navigation, opportunities and funding that we're also addressing the need for multiple languages and also audio uh, for some folks who may not have access to um, other ways of also getting the information. Um, if you cannot, thank you, Lily. Faith Bautista also has um, a comment in the chat. Yeah. Um... Where's my chat now? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so so the recommendations are on point. I mean, thank you guys. Um, I'm just curious who, how do we proceed with uh, recommendations, especially I think these are easy things to do, especially working with nonprofits and with affordable connectivity program. And also, um, you know, Lily mentioned already the, the in languages, it's just how important it is, um, especially in the, uh, Asian community that we have 60 different languages that's being used in the country. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Harrison, are we all still on? Okay, I thought, <laughs> I thought we had dropped the call. Um, so to answer Faith's question, the critical part of what we're doing today is making these recommendations to the FCC. And, and granted, we understand the practicality of these recommendations, 
particularly the digital equity one, that we um, can promote and advocate those type of uh, recommendations in our communities. But for the sake of today's deliberation, we are going to be voting on these recommendations and we will be forwarding these recommendations to the FCC Chairwoman's Office for consideration as they work towards uh, model policies um, and, and, and model policies for states and localities per the they're required via the infrastructure bill. And so interestingly, we are a piece of the puzzle that includes the FCC's Digital Discrimination Task Force and then the other processing that the, the FCC would be uh, engaging on over the, the next year maybe until the statutory deadline when they're supposed to actually release these uh, policy updates and, and, and um, uh, policy recommendations to states and localities. And so, um, Dr. Turnerly, are you back on? You wanted to talk a little bit about how this comes together via the FCC a little bit. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. <laughs> I changed computers in the process of watching John Dan's presentation. Um, so much better. We can hear you loud and clear. Now. I know I feel digitally <laughs> equitable right now. Um, OK, so I um, just wanted to follow up. I think the presentation, first of all, Dr. Harrison, Dr. Gant, um, Esquire, Joy, thank you very much for your participation and for all the committee members. Um, I do want to reiterate what Chairwoman Gates said for everybody who is watching, that this is one part of the pie of the broader deliberations on the digital discrimination um, statute that the FCC has been charged to conquer by November 2023. And so people like Dewana Terry, Sanford Bishop, Alejandro work are actually working very diligently to do a series of open meetings. So I had shared with Heather that I thought it was important to make sure this committee was very much aware that there is a website, the FCC, that is devoted to um, this task force that has been appointed by the chairwoman, as well as an email. Um, they are encouraging listening uh, meetings to actually hear people chime in on their particular opinions and to figure out who is not at the table uh, with regards to these issues. And so I think as everyone is considering the great work of this committee, it's important to know that it is part of a larger contextualization of how we operationalize this concept as part of the fulfillment of the IIJA. And um, so I think, uh, Chairwoman Gate, that's what you wanted me to share because I've been sort of following that carefully. Uh, please do know that if you do have meetings with the FCC around this, that they have to be ex parte because they are part of an open proceeding as well, with the exception, I assume, of this meeting, where the report has to go to the chairwoman for approval. But, um, you know, I just think, again, to Faith's point, there's just a, a combination of a lot of things, and Lily's point, with regards to um, the digital adoption activities and literacy activities versus what I think this group tried to do well, which is to give states and localities some framework for operationalizing the deployment side. And so I think if, if you add those together, you just at least have a perfect um, pathway towards what should be considered or reconsidered as these conversations and deliberations um, ensue with the FCC, uh, but want people to realize as you think about the voting on this final report, it's just one piece of a broader discussion of which your organization can have continued input into. So hopefully, Jamil, I spoke on behalf of the FCC. Um, quite diligently in terms of that process and Chairwoman Gate and Vice Chairwoman Susan Allen. Um, hopefully we were able to give people greater context as they go towards vote. Thank you, Jamila. Would you like to respond? Oh no, I don't have anything to add about the Digital Discrimination Task Force at this time, but thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And a uh, point for clarification, Lily, uh, your comment about multiple language, was that specifically a request for an, uh, an edit to the report? Yeah, it would be. Can you repeat? Sorry. sorry. I'm, having, I'm, I'm also, sorry, I'm having uh, audio issues as well. Um, yeah, it would be just making sure as we roll it out, uh, a recommendation for the next version uh, of how some of this can be adopted, right, into the practical sense. Um, just making ensuring that there is um, 
considerations around the cost of that because that's what I hear in the community to be able to translate a lot of um, these programs in ways that the community can understand it takes you know translation dollars as well and so just making sure we consider that into criteria for them. Okay so recommendations for the CEDC to continue with the further discussion on cost and um, and uh, multiple languages is that a sort of a recommendation for the DEI working group in their ongoing activities? Would that work for you, Lily? You mean, you mean, uh, you mean uh, Faith, Faith and Satita? I believe that was Lily again, yes. Oh, Lily. Oh. Okay. But, but I, mean, I, agree with, this, I agree uh, with Lily, though. It should be multiple languages. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. And let me just add, uh, Madam Chair, I think these are appropriate matters to bring up within the other working yes. groups. Mm -hmm. um, yes, because we had, we had ad hoc members from the other working groups, and they, they were all kind of given that opportunity and that space to share these ideas. So I think those ideas are incorporated to the extent they were raised within the context of this report. So I think that anything else we're talking about, we're talking about the additional work streams that are available and ongoing from innovation and access and from diversity and equity. And they all still have lots of work to be done on these issues and that they're planning. They're actually planning work on these issues. So I would ask that they incorporate those into the yes, work. Yes, and I, recommended, I recommend that to uh, working group chair, <laughs> Dr. Harrison, you all take that into consideration and 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 I think they fall appropriately in what ongoing activities within the other work streams. So thank you, uh, Faith and Lily, for those comments. Um, I see uh, Susan, uh, uh, vice <laughs> chair, would like to comment. I just want to add to, add that uh, the Asian American is the most diverse group. I deal with it with the SBA. Um, the SBA's uh, uh, CNPP program has is been dealing with the multi multi ethnic group within Asian. Uh, we do have a hundred languages and dialect and uh, spread all over, but it's not going to be possible to translate or transliterate all that into a hundred. We're going to be practical about it. Uh, to uh, on that point, I truly think it's time for us to bring John Yang in, Asian American Justice Center. Uh, he works closely with the other justice centers, uh, such as the one in California. They represent the Asian American community well, and they are multi-language. The four dominant ones are the one Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, uh, uh, the, the the Southeast Asians, uh, and I know I, we can go into that, but I. I I'm glad that this is raised, that cost is a factor, although we have a lot of money, but we don't want to, to become the obstacle uh, to be the one that uh, raised 100 languages or whatever it is. So please, let's put our heads together and bring John Yang in from the AJC, a Asian American Justice Center. Thank you, Susan. Great yeah. points. <laughs> um, Madam Chairwoman Faith, was that another comment, Faith? Your hand was up again. Yeah, I, I just want to add the sixth largest Asian that represents the um, the 2% population of this country, namely China, India, Philippines, Korean, Vietnamese, and Japanese. So those are the six languages and six uh, sub-ethnic group that represents one or 2% population 8% population of the U.S., um, of Asian population in the U.S. Okay. And Madam Chairwoman, if, if I can, uh, to both of my chairwomen, if I can suggest also that this issue should apply across the work streams as groups are developing different workshops and different documents to go into the public domain, that we remain sensitive as a diversity council that um, our Asian American allies need to have that uh, breadth of representation. And I would actually suggest for any group that is a part of the equity council, even those who are less abled, as well as um, other populations, Latino, African-American, et cetera, that we just be sensitive to that as to our charter 
to ensure that we're equitably thinking about those considerations. Yep. Recognizing that we are one of the most diverse uh, councils that the FCC has put together, I fully confident that the members will speak up and make sure that everybody's represented in the work that we'll, be, we'll continue to do over the next few months. Right. From a procedural standpoint, just a quick question for you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, it appears that that comment uh, would be something that would be more in the spirit of the committee. But for the purposes of the working group, um, are we to um, are we suggesting that that will be taken in as an editorial edition, or will we need to vote on this report so that we can proceed with the work of integrating these other uh, issues? So I want to just make sure procedurally we stay on track to take yeah. that the report to vote. So it sounds to me, so, um, yeah. please correct me if I'm wrong, that we need to keep this in mind in the framing of the future work streams, but more importantly, um, to Dominique, if there is a way to um, add in sensitivity to that, if it's, you know, as long as it's reasonable, as, as it's been stated, or we can park and lot that and put that and ensure that that's part of the next work. I just want to make sure we stay on task for moving yeah, the proce report. Procedurally, we're putting it in the hands of the DEI working group to put within the work streams of their current work right now. Um, we, as we've talked about in meetings, our primary focus is digital discrimination. Um, and then we did take the privilege of adding recommendations of digital equity. And so I think it falls well into the work that's currently on ongoing with the DEI working group and the other working groups too, to make sure that they take into account the needs of diverse populations, including the Asian population. So for, for the sake of this, it's, we will reserve, we would not be doing any editorial privileges on the actual report. Okay. All right, uh, DEI working group, uh, no, no more questions, comments. I do have um, a note from Cyan, if you'd like to just share your comment for public record. Oh, sure, yes. I just wanted to, to thank the, the working group for incorporating um, many of the considerations that I shared on behalf of NDIA. Uh, especially during the time when we reconvene to uh, uh, get closer to uh, uh, more shared support for the report. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I see Susan and Nicole, you still, do you still have your hands up or is it technical difficulty? <laughs> no, I, I have my hand, I do have my hands up. Just one more okay. comment as you solicited, just comment, um, Madam mm -hmm. Chairwoman. Um, I would like to rec make also uh, encourage, not make a recommendation, but encourage that uh, once the procedural aspect of this report is completed, that um, based on where it falls, it is shared with the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA, who is um, not necessarily charged with this particular implementation of the statute, but should actually see the good work of this committee when it comes to the equitable um, and universal access of broadband resources to underserved communities. So I wanted to just put that out there that, uh, you know, as a comment, uh, that this report be shared with other agencies that are working alongside the IIJA to understand at least the slice of the bigger portion that the FCC has taken on. Thank you. Thank you. We will add that. All right. Any more, uh, uh, Dominique, without any more questions and comments, uh, Jamila, any questions or comments? We would like to open up questions and comments from the public. Uh, Madam Chair, that is actually scheduled for after the vote. After the on vote. On our agenda. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay. All right. Dr. Harrison, would you like to refer? Your wonderful report. Before I complete that comment, I do want to go back and thank you very much, Dr. Harrison, and the whole DEI working group for your diligence and your commitment. As Holly said, for the past 10 months, 
You all accepted the challenge. You all accepted, continue to show up and work hard after July 22. And I am internally grateful for your uh, collegiality and your expertise and your willingness to engage in sometimes very difficult conversations. And so on that note, Dr. Harrison, would you like to refer your report for a vote? Yes, I would. Thank you so much. Thank you again to the whole DEI working group. And so on that note, I would like to seek unanimous consent from CEDC voting members to adopt part one of the report entitled Recommendations and Best Practices to Prevent Digital Discrimination and Promote Digital Equity that, that was presented by the Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group. And these recommendations include six recommendations for consideration by the FCC to prevent digital discriminations by ISPs. Secondarily, it also includes 13 recommendations. The working group encourages the FCC to work with states and localities to seek, develop, deepen resources and cap capabilities to advance digital equity. And on top of that, we would also like to recommend that the FCC share these recommendations with the NTIA and other agencies as requested by our vice chair. So on that note, I would like to open up the floor for any vote, for any no votes and any, I'd and like any, to make, uh, I'd like to sorry. make the motion. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to make the motion uh, as just described uh, that we uh, approve this, uh, these three recommendations from this committee. Thank you so much. Do I have a second? Okay. At this point, I would like to open for any uh, seeking unanimous consent. I would like to provide a few seconds for any no votes or any um, no or any abstain. And for the record, Madam Chair, was that? Joyce Lynn Tate seconding the motion of Stephen Roberts. Yes. Yes, it is. Yes, yes it was. Yes. Thank you. Yes, it is. Okay. The report is adopted with unanimous consent. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I we're really excited about continuing to work together. This is not the end. We have so much more work that we're doing, a lot of further discussions and a lot of other upcoming recommendations on digital equity, not only from the DEI working group, but from the other working groups that we, you will hear from sometime in the first quarter of 2023. I am extremely appreciative of all the work. I don't know if Susan and Nicole want to offer some comments at this point. I just want to say well done, well done. Yeah. And I would just like to say thank you, everybody. Again, well done. And we've got many more months in this charter to do uh, more great work. <laughs> so actually, um, yes. Madam Chairwoman, you may want to, before the, uh, for the public, just let them know that there's going to be a series of more work coming out of this committee before we actually uh, close out. Oh, absolutely. There's a lot of more work to come out from the different work streams <laughs> over the next seven months. So please stay tuned. For, for more work and more recommendations. This, our, our work is not done. This is just the beginning. This is just the opening call and we will continue to follow up and offer more and more comments and recommendations. And so on that note, Jamila, any questions or comments from the public that? I will refer to uh, Kayla. Kayla, have, have you received any questions from the public? Hello. Confirming that I have not received any questions from the public. Thank you, Kayla. You're Thank welcome. You. I think the DEI group did such a great job. Everybody understood everything. So we'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> so. You anticipated all the questions and had all the answers. Kudos. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for providing all the answers.
Okay, on that note, I would like to hand it over to you, Jamila, for any closing comments. Oh, thank you so much. What a lovely, lovely meeting. I think we've been all anticipating this day for a long time. So I'd just like to thank everyone for coming. We've had an outstanding attendance, uh, all of your colleagues showing up to support you in this work. Uh, and I think that it's clear from the presentation that the task from Chairwoman Rosenworcel to the CEDC was seriously considered and seriously undertaken by the entire CEDC. It was a whole of the CEDC effort that examined digital discrimination and how it impacts the lives of students, caregivers, job seekers, parents, schools, and healthcare providers, among others. So today's report, as you can tell, would not have been possible without the significant personal commitment from everyone on the CEDC, but especially on the DEI working group, being willing to do several things at once, including meeting many, many times a week to interview, to do research, to deliberate, to reassess. It was an organic, robust, ongoing process. And that's the kind of commitment that the FCC is truly grateful for as we work toward a common goal. And I would like to give special thanks to DEI Working Group Chair Dominique Harrison, Dr. Dominique Harrison, Joy Cheney, and Dr. John Gant. Your leadership on this journey and this process has been invaluable. Thank you so very much. And thank you also to all at the FCC who have been involved in supporting this work, Rashawn, Kayla, and Aureli. We all are working in the background, but it has required quite a commitment of their time as well. And for everyone's information, the adopted report will be posted to the CEDC's website and it will be transmitted to FCC Chairwoman Rosenworcel on behalf of the CEDC from Chair Heather Gate. And we thank Chair Heather Gate for her leadership and her steady hand and Dr. Nicole Turner Lee for her inspiration and her many hours of review and editing. And Dr. and I, I call her doctor. Dr. Susan R. Allen <laughs> for all of her many hours of work reviewing, sitting in on interviews, um, just always being there for everything that we needed. And so I thank you all, everyone. I'm personally very proud to have this report on the CEDC's works uh, website as a reflection of you all's dedication to this work. So unless there's anything further, I want to wish on behalf of the FCC, everyone a safe and wonderful Thanksgiving and holiday season. And we'll see you all soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye now. Thank, Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.